very lucky to have Don Reynolds with us at Clay Arts Centre. He's an artist at Clay Arts Centre. He's a teacher at Clay Arts Centre. And um, I'm sure you're going to learn a lot from him tonight. So I'm going to hand it over to you, Don. Take it away. You're welcome. Uh, hey, everybody. Thanks so much for coming tonight. It's kind of blowing me away that um, there was this much interest uh, in this uh, demonstration, this talk about underglaze. Um, I want to give a big thanks to Regina, um, who at the at the Clay Art Center, and Jessica at the Clay Art Center, and also Emily, who have all helped me uh, get this thing going, and they're hosting it and allowing me to bring it to all of you guys as well. So let's let's get going, right? This is about underglaze, and I know a lot of you um, from chats that I've seen are beginning potters and you're not really sure what underglaze is, where does it fall in. Um, it's not a glaze and it's not a slip either. Slip we know is basically a liquid form of clay uh, that has some kind of metallic oxides in it uh, for colorant. And slips are good to use on greenware, something before it's fired because the clay content in the slip also will shrink. So they need to shrink together. If you try to put slip on bisque, it will crack off. And then again, it may work. You might prove us wrong. Um, there are instances where it will work. Underglazes are commercially manufactured and they use what's called a fritted material fritted, F-R-I-T-T-E-D. And that just means that it's been previously fired and then pulverized. And because it's been fired, it's already shrunk. So underglazes can go on greenware or bisqueware. Uh, one of the reasons that I choose to decorate with underglaze is that very reason, because I can go back and touch up things that I may have missed or that didn't work out um, after the bisque before I glaze things. Um, so under glazes, you can get them. I, I use Amico velvet under glazes the most. Um, you can get them in pint sizes. You can get them in little two ounce jars. Um, I use the velvet under glaze because it mixes, the colors mix together because I can uh, do some corrections in the bisque if I need to. Um, underglazes are available at most of your ceramic distributors. Um, if you don't have anything near you, you can get them off of Amazon as well. There's a whole lot of companies, manufacturers of underglaze. This is another style. This is Speedball. I don't know if I can get that close enough um, for you to see. So they have a line of underglazes that work as well. I'm not that familiar with them. You can get underglazes from Mako, from Duncan, um, Amico, which I use. Uh, what else was there? I know there was another. Spectrum also has underglazes as well. You know, you might find some commercially made underglazes at your local distribution place as well. So that being said, um, I'm going to do a quick little exercise because I use wax with my underglazes um, to get, oh, one thing I should say about underglazes, uh, as opposed to a glaze, the underglaze will stay where it's put, right? So it doesn't move, it won't run um, even underneath the glaze. So I use it because I can get really crisp edges and colors and they'll stay where they're put. Um, but I wanted to show you quickly. So this um, is a plate that's been bisque fired and you see all those colors on there. But in order for me to get to this point, I have to start with the colors, the colors that might appear to be on top of the black, like in this one. 
um, but they actually are underneath. So I start with laying the colors down. Then I use a wax to put a pattern on. And then I go over that usually with something dark or contrasting because I do mix up colors as well. I, I'm fond of colors on, a, on what appears to be a black background, but it's really the last part that I paint on. So this uh, illustration, you can see I've put some pieces of scotch tape on this uh, and I painted it or I, I used a magic marker to make it yellow. So now if I go over this with a marker, the marker is going to resist every place where the tape is put down. And then I do not do this with my bisque wear, but I can clean these off. So you can see it appears like I have these yellow pieces kind of floating on this black background, sort of like this. Um, but really the yellow went, the color went on first, then the wax, or in this case, case scotch tape, just to kind of illustrate that. Um, and then the black on top or another color. Let me ditch that real quick. So I use wax as a resist. Um, and I also use it, see if we can get this more underneath here. This is just a banding wheel that I have. I'm going to quickly center this. And I like to sometimes defined sections. You can see on this plate, um, this part right here, this white band that separates the rim, which is like this, a brick pattern from what I've done in the center here. So this is, I usually, I use a wax band just to separate the two. Um, and I do that on cups as well. <laughs> see if we can show that off. Um, so here it is on a cup. And I've got that same kind of brick pattern. But I also have the wax band between and up here. Any place where you see my white clay is wax. All right. So I get this on here. I kind of want to put it in the center. And then I sometimes will check myself real quick with a pencil to see if I'm going to get it right. Good enough. So I'm going to grab a little brush. I use a little paint palette with wells in it, especially when I'm going to work with wax. The wax that I'm using right now just comes from my local supplier, Ceramic Supply. It's just a wax resist. Um, but because I use it uh, to do more elaborate things, I don't want to just leave this jar open and let it get all hardened. So I pour myself a little at a time, clean it up. I always clean the threads so that the cap goes on and off securely and it won't dry up on me. And now I'm just going to use a round liner brush. This is a very old one, but you can see that the bristles are long. We do have uh, something to email people like a list of what I use. So I have listed brushes and the sizes that they are, but I'll tell you that when I purchase brushes, I get kind of middle of the road brushes. They're not dirt cheap. Um, but they're not really expensive either because when you paint on ceramic, they wear down. Um, and so you're going to go through them eventually. So I'm going to get some wax going on this brush. When I paint with this, because it has long or longer bristles, let me grab another one. 
when I paint with this, instead of me using the tip, right, like a pencil, I'm going to use the side, I'm going to bend those bristles. So see how they, they bend and you'll see when I paint that I'm going to create just a band. When I do this, I'm really interested with the quality of the line on either side of the brush. So I put it down here. And then at some point you just have to commit. You got to keep breathing, but you stop trying to move. I hope that you guys can see the wax going on. It looks like you can from that view. Um, my wax comes and it's clear. Um, but I just put food coloring in it. And that's these little these little bottles of, of food dye. Um, and that will change the color so that I can see it as it dries. So I can still see it. I give it kind of a greenish look. Um, and that helps just it. It, oh, what I want to say is that the food coloring is not going to harm your piece. It's not going to color the clay. It's going to burn away. Um, it won't do anything to your wax. Um, all right. And it's really the wax that I use is fast drying. It's similar to the stuff that you're going to use on the foot of a pot when you're glazing. So now that I got that on there, it dries really quick. So I'm pretty sure that that's nice and dry. I'm going to quickly try and use some of my underglaze colors and show you how I do a blend in here. I have all kinds of different brushes, right? So when I'm going to try and do some more solid coverage, I use a soft fan brush to do that. And these are a bunch of different soft fan brushes. The bristles are really soft, holds a lot of paint. Again, they have longer bristles. All right, so I've picked two colors that I'm going to mix here. And what I'm going to do is load the brush with each color and then just start from one point. So I'll have this one be lighter in the center, right? And as I lay this on, because I'm on bone dry greenware, it's gonna dry in relatively quickly. Go out a little further than I need to. And now because I painted wax here, it's gonna resist. And I'm going to go into the center a little bit, come back out. And I kind of toy around with this and do it a couple times, right? As I'm laying this stuff on, each subsequent layer takes a little bit longer to dry in. So that allows me to kind of do some color mixing right on the surface. simply done. And of course, I'm using a banding wheel and doing it in a circular motion, but it doesn't mean that you couldn't brush across your plate either. Um, I'm going to leave the rim of this one white. Okay, let me get rid of some of these. All right. I need to now start planning some patterns that I will paint. And what I've always talked about, but just discovered um, is practicing some of these marks that I make um, on paper plates. And so I bought plates that are like a knockoff of Chinette, if you know what that is. Um, 
So there goes that one. Let's see, I want to make sure I'm staying on here in the right spot. All right. Oh, so these are like Chinette plates that I've just painted on and tried to create. And these are not precious, right? So I don't, they don't, uh, if I make a mistake, so what? And I can use the back also to kind of test what kind of marks my brush is going to make. Throw that there. Going to oh, leave that up. I'll move this out of the way just a little bit. Um, this might be a little hard to see in the beginning. Um, so what I'm going to do is use a marker, a Sharpie marker. Um, instead of a pencil, on my piece, I use a pencil and I kind of roughly divide it in half. And then I'll divide that in half. And these are rough. Sometimes if I feel like I don't have it right, I'll make a couple, you know, lines in here. And a lot of times, you know, if you want to use one of those circular um, decorator tools, I guess, you know, to get exact spacing on your piece, you can do it. I just look so that I can kind of visually make sure that all of these little pie sections are roughly the same size. Um, like if these two were much smaller than these two, then I would know that I'm not completely right on here. So I always divide it in half or in quarters to start with. Then I'm gonna give myself some guides here. And again, I'll do this uh, with pencil. And pencil, if I make a wrong mark, I can just kind of rub it really hard and it will smudge itself out. So I don't have to worry about that. Now I'm thinking that each of these sections, I'm just going to roughly divide those. Much, much lighter, though. All I want, I'm looking for points because when I make these patterns, all I really do is connect one point to the next point. So now I've kind of got this mess laid out here. Um, let's see, I'm gonna draw on it with pencil real quick. Oh, I'll do it with a dark. I'm going to use purple now so you can see the difference. So when I'm going to try and set up a pattern here, let me make sure this is going to go right. I want you to see more of it. So what I'm going to do, so I have these points, right? There's a point here, 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 and here on this. So I'm going to roughly draw just an arc that kind of is joining this point with this point. And then I can do a similar thing right here. And I'll just, I can just keep going. So now I don't, can you see kind of like a pattern starting to emerge? out of this. And if if I make a mistake and I go up here, I'm like, uh, I just redo it and kind of go up into that stuff. And then when I want to start painting, you know, like my, let's see, I'd be doing kind of marks like these. So 
very rough, but you get the idea. It starts to make that kind of laurel look. So I know that when I'm putting these lines together, I don't want them to be very close because I have to get the pattern on either side of the line, right? I've got these marks here and I'm gonna have the same kind of marks here on this side. Let's do these. Woo, when you're going fast, you can hardly even make a leaf. Okay. All right, so I need to fit both of those things in. And so you see now I can start to get that peak um, point. Whoops, Let me go down um, on there. And I will do that stuff with a brush. Let me show you. Get rid of that. Get rid of this. This one had partially been drawn on. It's not a big deal. I'm going to switch. Oh, you know what? I'm going to save this because this is brushes. We'll wait a second. I'm going to start stamping a pattern onto this one. And what I use for this stuff is some found objects that I had. Um, it is this, what is it? It's a, it's a caulk saver. So this, we'll see if we can get this here. It's called poly foam caulk saver. Comes in different, uh, different thicknesses, and I think the colors denote different densities. Um, contractors, I think, stuff it uh, between the window and their drywall to kind of help gap that, that airflow out. But I make simple little stamps out of them um, that I can uh, stamp the wax with. And I'm going to, that all started, right? If you if you had kids around, um, this is a Nerf gun bullet, and this is kind of what started it. It's like a spongy foam material, and I would use it to stamp patterns on things. Um, when I started out, right, almost all of my stuff. Um, was just making marks. I was only making marks. I wasn't really designing those marks into anything or arranging those marks. So I'm going to tap a little wax. I wonder if you can see this. Yep. Little wax onto the tip of this that I've kind of altered and made it into a square. Try and get that in front of my white shirt so you can see it. And then I just start kind of pressing that on there and moving, right? And I'm not super concerned if it doesn't look exactly like a rectangle because when it's finished, I know that it's gonna resemble kind of a brick wall a garden wall. Can you guys see these getting put on here? Hopefully. Let's uh, do a couple more on here. So that's the idea there. So I stamp and this is where I had begun the process. And you can see possibly now on this plate like a finished rim with um, these markings. And you can see sometimes I don't care if there are spaces or if I leave uh, you know more space between marks in some areas. It's kind of like those old, um, like a brick wall that's kind of like that never meant to be, was never meant to be seen like an exterior wall. So it's like sloppy. The, uh, 
the grout or the cement in the center of it is a little sloppier. All right, so now that is one part of me putting wax on things is to use these stamps um, just from this foam material. The other part of what I do And here, I guess I can say that when I started this process of using wax as a resist, <laughs> I started just by going kind of silly with a brush, right? I'm not a painter per se, um, but I would just, so this was painted orange. I did wax kind of squigglies, and then I painted over that with black. Um, also, another early form of what I did was just with dots, you know, and here I was just trying to get them all, you know, close and give it some, some interest, some fun look, there's a decal, but really it was just dots and I wasn't necessarily arranging them. And then that started to morph into arranging those marks, those dots, using different kinds of things to leave. Really, this is all stamped wax patterning. And then again, it just evolved into like a cleaner arrangement of those lines. So really, that I always say that I'm really just arranging repetitive marks. And then when it comes to brushwork, I kind of do the same thing, um, but with a brush. I don't really use the brush in a painterly way. Like I'm not doing shading, I'm not doing an oil painting. So these are some of the style brushes that I use. These are Jap or Asian calligraphy brushes. And you know, you can get them very large as well. They usually have bamboo handles or something like that. Again, it's got nice long bristles, but they always come to a really nice point. Let's see, so you can see that better on here. A nice point, all right. Let me divide this one up. Oh, this one is divided into quarters a little bit. So when I make marks with brushes, based on what I was doing with those little foam stamps that I was making, I do a similar thing. So my brush stroke is really just a press and release in the same way that I was pressing that stuff, uh, pressing the little stamp down. I'm just, I start with the tip, press it, and then release. And I can come over here, in this case, I'm kind of bending them out a little bit. So really, it's just a press and release. Every time I go in my paint, kind of, let's see if I kind of twirl this brush in my fingers so that I can keep that nice sharp tip. Put one there, put one there, and then just a little one right there. And if I needed to, I could come in here and kind of clean up some of these edges, but I usually don't. All right, so you get the idea. Um, there can be, this is all just press and release. and a different size brush, right, is just going to do a smaller kind of petal. Whoops. Well, this is my favorite brush in the whole world. And it's so small that it's not necessarily working on this paper plate. It's just kind of beating up to where the large one left a nice mark, but that's okay. We are fine. 
going to show you some of the lines that I will make on these things. I use liner brushes. Let's see if I can show off some of these. These are very small brushes, hardly any bristles. They're round. It also has a long, um, fairly long bristle so that I can bend that when I'm painting. And let me quickly, well, I guess quick is not gonna happen. I'm just quickly penciling on this. So I have an idea, right, of where the line is going to go. Okay. And then I usually just start from a center. And I paint. And so this is actually where I'm dragging the brush, right? And not just pressing and releasing. I do press, but come up. And again, I want to leave space right here so that I have room for the leaves on either side of that. All right, quickly doing that, go back to this brush. And then when I'm doing these, right? So when I'm holding a, a greenware plate, right? It could break at any, any moment. So I'm very careful with it, taking my time. And you see now when I'm doing this, I'm just slightly reducing the pressure that I'm pressing down with so I can make these appear to be smaller marks as we're going. Well, these are getting really small, but it's okay. And then I'll do, well, I didn't paint that side. Again, so it's a it's really just a press and release with this brush. And I'm gonna I start off making them large and then I'll make them start making them smaller and smaller as I go. And then this is where I need that space. I'm going fast. So let me tell you, when I paint this in real life um, on a piece, um, I'm painting really, really slowly. Um, it's hard to get that up there so that you can see what I painted. But you see how these, it's just press and release, and I'm slowly getting smaller as I get up here. But I need space between my two original uh, lines or the stems, right? So I can put the leaves in there. All right. And then, well, we talked a little bit about, you know, you want to choose brushes for what they can do for you. Um, so that's why I've got liners. I've got the uh, Asian calligraphy brushes. I've got the fan brushes. Um, I also, I can show that too. Um, sometimes we'll use angled brushes so that they have angles. And if I use the angled brush, I am, it's again, it's a press and release, but I can get, 
uh, much more of a leaf shape. Well, it's supposed to happen. You know, and if you're a real good painter, you could make these kind of marks can, you know, be used to make birds or whatever. You can do a couple and add things in the middle of them. Um, Don, can I interrupt you just to uh, direct you with some questions here? As okay. a lot of questions about the wax, um, yeah. things like um, how do you clean the wax? Do you thin the wax out? Um, maybe you could give some pointers on the wax. Okay. So and let me just yep. sorry. One more questions. Second. Okay. Uh, any tips on removing wax if you make a mistake? So we've a lot of questions about the wax and how many yeah. coats of underglaze as well. Right. Um, so coats of underglaze, I'm going to do like to do solid coverage underneath things like with my light colors, I'm going to do three coats. Um, and what I do is I let it dry in between each coat. Uh, because I am painting on uh, bone dry greenware, the uh, the the underglaze on the surface kind of dries in really fast. The moisture gets sucked into the piece, um, so I can do those first couple layers really quickly, one right right after another. Um, with the wax, wax you can thin it, right? Sometimes I thin it if I'm trying to uh, paint bands using the banding wheel like I was in the beginning, so that the brush moves a little smoother along the surface. Um, but when I'm kind of doing these press and release kind of things or stamping a pattern, I am uh, really, boy, I, I lost my uh, train of thought there. Um, oh, I'm using the wax just straight right out of the, out of the jar. Um, it's mixed that way. Some of these waxes, uh, they, like after a year or so, they start to emulsify um, and they harden up. And it, it, you know, that so I try to keep mine uh, closed as, as long as I can for that reason. As far as cleanup goes, as soon as you are done uh, waxing something with a brush or a stamp, you want to get that brush into some warm water right away um and then warm water and soap and you know dish soap hand soap anything like that just mild soap is gonna clean that brush out you if you let the wax harden it's ri just ridiculously hard to clean the wax out if you make a mistake and i do make mistakes um with wax uh you like i've learned to control how much is on my brush so it doesn't go drip, 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 you know, on my way to the piece. Um, but I, I tend to just panic at first, right? I'm like, oh no, what happened? Um, and then I get mad at myself for letting it happen. And then I really just go with it. I'm like, okay, let's see what I can do. I'm going to leave it, right? The only way to get it out would be to re-bisque fire the piece and burn the wax out. Um, if you have a kiln in your home or if you have a little test kiln and you can quickly fit one piece in there, um, then yeah, burn the wax off if it's, if it's terrible. Um, but otherwise, you know, go carefully and then kind of adapt maybe to what's happening on that plate. Let's see, I did the rim. Uh -oh. So I'm to the point now where I'm going to find my plate that has wax on it. And you can, as I move it around, it's possible maybe you're seeing a little glinting, maybe not. It's hard to see. 
but this one had the underglaze color on it. I waxed a pattern, try to hold it in here. You can see it a little better here. Um, and now that has dried on. I'm gonna put the top color on this. And in this case, it's just gonna be black. I always try to basically recenter when I put on these banding wheels. This is a Shimpo Nidec. Uh, they were bought out by Nidec uh, banding wheel. And it's great. It's really heavy, but it keeps going. Like it just keeps spinning. It doesn't stop until I really stop it. Uh, so now I'm going to use a fan brush. And I've got a specific fan brush that I only use for black paint and you can see it's stained stained black and with this i do water down this black a little bit so that it beads off of the wax a little easier and so this is like the coolest part let's see if i can get this in here where you guys can see more of it um so this is the payoff. And I would say, you know, if you if you want to try some of this stuff, just fool around like I did in the beginning, just making crazy marks in wax. And so now when I put this on here, you can see the patterns start to emerge as it's being resisted by the wax. Sometimes I give it a help, um, just try and push it off of those areas. These dots that you see on here, and a, and a lot of my work has dots in it. I use uh, either a Q-tip, like an ear swab, to do those dots, or sometimes I'll use the back end of a brush. And so now you see this kind of messy, right plate emerging from here. A lot of times the, um, the underglaze is gonna beat up on that wax, right? I do not go in and remove it. Um, in the interest of moving this along, I'm gonna leave this here and not do another coat on it. I'm gonna leave that, no. Cover that up. So I can show you that after the piece is fired, right? So just because I have that layer of wax, which is like what, 1 32nd of an inch? I don't really know how thick it is. It's not very thick. Um, but that is enough to keep that underglaze that beat it up on top of the wax from firing onto your piece. It creates just a little bit of a gap between the clay and the underglaze. And that allows me to clean that off after the piece has been bisque. And I'm gonna show you that. Ooh. This is a fairly dirty, process and I don't really want to contaminate other things with it. So I'm just gonna I'm gonna lay out some newspaper here so I can catch all my little flakes. And now let's see. So now this is something that's been fired, a big bowl and you can see I've done inside. I've done outside um, and I'm going to try and get up close so you can see how this underglaze has where it, it's beaded up on here. I'm going to remove that stuff with a couple different things. I use these are um, these are tile grout cleaning brushes. Um, so it's like for scrubbing your bathroom shower grout or whatever, but it has nice hard bristles on here. So 
So I hold this stuff and I kind of get rid of all of that stuff. It's really important when you're doing this to have a nice clean space or covered with newsprint that's going to catch all of these little pieces that are going to pop off. And in some cases where you can see a shadow still remain on there of the underglaze, I don't know why, but it kind of burns away um, in the firing. So I'm hoping you guys can see this, that I'm cleaning stuff off of this underglaze. So I'm starting to get the pattern nice and cleaned up, um, just like the pieces that are glazed, right, to where I have all of that wax kind of cleaned up or all of the, the beaded stuff cleaned up off of the wax. So that's the idea to clean those up. Um, this particular brush, is really, really good for cleaning inside of rounded stuff. So I can hold this, clean off. The last step that I do before I glaze this stuff, um, I will use so I kind of got some of that cleaned off out of there. And you can see all of the different um, bands that I waxed, you know, that separate all the different kind of sections and patterns that I had going on in there. Um, Don, a couple of questions about your clay body. Could you give us a quick uh, I will, but hang on one second. So okay. the last thing that I do to the, the piece before I glaze is I take these kind of, this one is completely beat up, but they're like those little plastic scrubbing pads. Um, this one has a soft yellow sponge inside it. Um, but I will hold that piece under the wa running water in the faucet and scrub it as clean as possible. So the whole piece is completely saturated and I clean it off, just water, um, no soap, no detergent of any kind. And then uh, I let that dry for at least 24 hours, sometimes longer before I go ahead and put a clear glaze on anything. I can let this sit here. So what kind of questions about my clay body are coming through? Oh, thank you, Don. Uh, mostly what type of clay body you're using and what brand? I do have that listed in the little sheet. That it's a two page thing of like, I'm explaining some of my supplies. So I use standard uh, supply um, number 213 which is a, a cone six or a mid-range porcelain. So these are fired to cone six when they're, when they're all finished. Um, I use it because it's white and I prefer to use white clay with a white ground, even though I know a lot of brown and especially red clay users um, and red clay lovers uh, will then just dip their entire piece into like a coating of white slip. Um, and I just, I don't do that step, but you could, you could definitely do that. I should also tell you that any of these techniques, like my little, it's not even a technique, right? It's just where, where I'm, I'm, what I say is arranging um, repetitive marks into a compelling pattern, right? It's that press and release, press and release. Try it with glazes, right? So where you put one glaze on as a base, let that dry, 
and then make these marks with another glaze on top, things are going to happen. Sometimes the glaze is going to be so stable it will stay right where it is. Sometimes it will begin to move and it might do really, might have a really interesting altering effect to the pattern that you originally painted. And it's always worth, you know, investigating that. Um, I would say if you're going to try any of this with your clay body, with, you know, test things out, right? And see what hap what's the difference between three coats of an underglaze and one coat or two coats. Um, what's, you know, what are differences on your clay body? Is it when I glaze it, is the glaze going to behave well? The clear glaze that I use um, is an Amico glaze, and it is, I'm going to show you, it is HF9, which is from their Sahara series of glazes, um, and it's a zinc-free clear. Is that right, or is it backwards to you? Uh, there we go. Now it reads a zinc free clear and it, it's HF9. I just, I use it and it's really forgiving and it works great on my stuff. Someone just told me that you can fire it to cone 10, but I wouldn't just throw it in your kiln at cone 10, test it first on something small um, to see. And that's always a key. Every time a manufacturer will will produce something for a specific range of firing, um, that's a recommendation, right? And through testing um, and some time spent with it, you're going to find out, oh, no, that does work. Or this particular color just burns away and I don't, nothing is left. Um, so you'll make those kind of uh, discoveries, as we say. It was a pleasure to have you, Don. Um, wonderful demonstration as always, and uh, lots and lots of comments here saying thank you and uh, people. Oh, thank you guys. Yeah, thank you. Good night.